The Minister, uh, Education Policy Committee will come to order. First up is um, Senator Gustafson and Senate File 449. Whenever you're ready, ready, Senator. Thank you. I also uh, need to get uh, the bill in order. There is an author's amendment. Is now the time to add that in, or should I begin the description? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Do you want to move the author's amendment? Yes, I would oh. like to move the, uh, the A1 amendment. Thank you. Okay. Um, Senator McQuaid. Uh, I'd like to move the A1 amendment for Senator Gustafson. So moved. Senator, begin. Thank you. So the bill that you're seeing here before you addresses some pretty extraordinary needs that we're seeing in our schools. I think anybody here who is a parent with school-aged children, if you've worked in education, as I know a lot of people on this uh, panel do, uh, or this committee do, you know that uh, the school mental health crisis is reaching a pretty critical point. Um, it was already something that schools were struggling with, but as the last few years have shown us, we are sort of at a breaking point. And this is one of those things that would address those concerns um, and be helpful. Um, so let me explain exactly what the bill does. The, it's going to require the uh, MDE to create a mental health lead to be resourced to school and staff. It's going to outline what assistance they provide. So they're going to be uh, provide a clearinghouse of information, resources, coordination of strategy between districts and schools, and help create plans aligned with other state agencies. Um, the bill is going to help uh, students in a mental health crisis, parents who are not trained or equipped to deal with mental health issues, schools, districts struggling to stay ahead of rising student mental health issues, and then multiple state agencies with a patchwork of jurisdiction are going to be able to sort of work together and streamline it. So I think the important thing to remember is that having individuals specifically responsible for overseeing and driving the development and implementation of mental health services in our schools is going to ensure that the program is properly organized and executed. Um, these leads would also work with school districts, um, health organizations, community groups uh, to create a comprehensive network uh, for support for students. Um, additionally, having lead positions for comprehensive school mental health services is going to demonstrate the state's commitment to the importance of mental health uh, and well-being for students as well. Um, it increases awareness, understanding of the benefits. A lot of times schools aren't aware of the benefits that they have available. Um, this would make that process more efficient. Um, and it also provides a menu of options for schools. So um, schools can use it when a crisis occurs. I've worked at several different school districts and unfortunately we've lost many of our students to mental health um, issues and it is devastating on uh, the school. Of course it's devastating on the family, but oftentimes um, in, in a school district you want to help and you're maybe not as trained as you could be or you're stretched so thin that you wish you could do more, but you maybe don't just have the resources or uh, the knowledge or the background to do that. This would provide that gap. So that gap that we're sort of seeing in between a school 
and the services that we can provide. It's necessary because um, it involves working with other schools to find out what works, what doesn't work, um, what's helpful. When you are, as one of the schools I taught at, we lost several students in one year. When you are faced with an inundation of, uh, of crisis at occurring in one school year, it becomes very difficult to handle that on your own. This would provide a level of support that we wasn't that uh, wasn't there before. Um, this bill has bipartisan support um, in, in, and has been worked on for several years. So we're asking for that today. I do have a couple of testifiers. So I'm not sure, Chair, if you want me to answer questions now or after the testifiers. Unless there's pressing to what you just said, I'd prefer to wait till the testifiers, if that's okay with everybody, unless... Yeah, let's wait till everybody's testified. Thank you, Senator. Sure, and I believe they'll be ready to go. Um, I, I think some are online and some are in person, so I will maybe hand it over to you to help me organize the order of those. Sorry, Senator. That's okay. Please repeat the question. Yeah, Mr. So Chair, um, I don't. Some uh, some of our testifiers are, are in person and some are online. So I was just hoping um, on your end you could maybe let me know who or you could um, oh, the, facilitate the order that they want that that they should go in. Yeah. Can we get the um, senator agenda for today, Paige? Is so she can see. Would that be helpful? Sure. Thank you. You're welcome, Mr. Chair. And Amy Jones is first on the list if she is here or hybrid. There. I'm here and available. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Thank you. Well, begin. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair Wazinski and members of the committee. My name is Amy Jones, and I'm an educational consultant and the chair of the state mental health and schools work group. I live in Shoreview. I'm a 30-year licensed classroom teacher and have worked in education at all levels including as an elected school board member in the Nonsview District, an administrator in Minneapolis and Stillwater, an instructional coach, a classroom teacher, and an adjunct professor at the university level. I'm an appointed member of the Minnesota State Advisory Council on Mental Health, and I'm also a certified mental health first aid facilitator for youth and adults. I've been working with Representative Muller for the last few years to add a position for a comprehensive mental health lead for students at MDE. We are one of the very few states that doesn't have such a position. We need it now more than ever. During our recent conversations with stakeholders, state agencies, and educational organizations, everyone agreed that we also need to add a lead position to support and coordinate improved mental health for school staff and teachers as well. Minnesota would be one of the first states to fund such a position to lead, coordinate, and support teacher and school staff mental health at a Department of Education. We acknowledge and appreciate all of the work around mental health that is happening at MDE. There are grant funded positions and programming that is supportive and effective, but all of these grants end. And we now know that our school's mental health challenges will not be ending anytime soon. We need a position with stable long-term funding to lead and coordinate all of the mental health work. Our stakeholders need a point person, someone specific to contact, someone who can coordinate and disseminate the best resources, trainings, and practices for the benefit of every student, teacher, and school staff member, someone who can communicate with stakeholders, seek out promising practices that can be shared and scaled up across the state. In addition, as we move toward adding mental health staff in buildings, this position could support the site-based positions to have access to best practices, resources, training, and programs with proven results that can be shared across the state. This would allow these site-based mental health positions to provide impactful support more quickly and efficiently. Representative Muller and I have been working to provide additional mental health support in Minnesota schools after seeing a growing and timely need. Senate File 449 would put Minnesota in line with other states that have a mental health in schools lead for students in the Department of Education. This position would not be tied to overseeing a grant, rather it would provide a much needed contact person to address the many challenges and opportunities currently facing our students' mental health. Over time, we've updated this bill to add a position for a mental health lead for school staff and teachers. This would be a non-grant funded position at the Department of Ed to lead, coordinate, and support school staff and teacher mental health. More than ever, we see our school staff and teachers struggling with their own mental health and the increasing challenge to support the mental health of their students. 
In the midst of the fourth school year impacted by the repercussions of the pandemic, we have many qualified, passionate, exceptional school staff and teachers leaving the profession. Not only is this a workforce crisis, but the stability of our educational system will be greatly impacted if we continue to hemorrhage these talented and dedicated school staff and teachers. Our state deserves positions to oversee and coordinate this work so that our students and school staff and teachers have the support they need to stay in our schools and be effective and successful. These crucial positions are long overdue, and if the pandemic has shown us anything, it has illuminated this glaring and growing need to improve mental health in our schools. Our students, school staff, and teachers deserve the support. I thank you for your time and hope for your support for Senate File 449. Thank you, um, Ms. Jones, and I just want to um, applaud your acknowledgement that it's not just the students who are suffering greatly, but a lot of our staff is as well, and so um, thank you for acknowledging that. Next testifier. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I also want to point out that is what the A1 amendment speaks to as well, is that it includes educators as part of the, the mental health uh, needs. Thank you. So is Kathy Zwanitzer here? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. We can hear you. Perfect. Um, well, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee for having me. Uh, my name is Kathy Zwanitzer, and I am the Director of Student Services for Centennial School District. Um, I've had the privilege of being an educator for the last 15 years, and the last eight I've been in a leadership position. Um, one of the best things about my job is helping people and providing supports and resources for families in need and students and staff, um, which Senate File 449 directly relates to. The two lead positions that are described in the proposed bill um, is a wonderful step towards building systems which all schools in the state of Minnesota can collaborate and support each other in our shared efforts to improve mental health and well-being of our students and staff. Um, mental health of students and staff is a topic which I am unfortunately extremely familiar with. Um, on average, in my position, um, I get about three to five calls at least a day where mental health is at the core of the issue. Um, so on Monday, I received a phone call from a principal who's navigating a situation between three fifth grade girls who can't get along, they all have mental health challenges um, in and outside of school and it's impacting their learning. Um, on Tuesday, I met with a staff member um, who was on the verge of quitting because um, of the verbal and physical aggression that she is experienced or experiencing with her students because of these students and the trauma that they've experienced, which relates to behaviors that we're seeing in school. Um, and just this morning, I had a, a core team meeting with a site trying to problem solve a vacant teaching position in a setting three uh, special education program that's been a revolving door over the last five plus years um, because of the high needs of the students in the programming and being able to find staff who can work with all the complex needs. Um, so these needs are all over. They're not unique to Centennial. Uh, we experience them every day. Mental health is a spectrum from the small crises that happen to the larger ones where we talk about people taking their own lives and um, definitely need to address them. Um, I am excited that I was asked to testify um, for this because it is so important to me. Um, you probably are the same as me when someone reaches out for help you go into problem solving mode and when it comes to mental health I get a phone call I call my colleagues I call Anoka County Children's Mental Health um, other mental health agencies um, care and treatment facilities with the hopes of connecting people and getting people the appropriate resources they need so with this bill, proposed bill, having dedicated people at the state level um, would be huge for people who are in my position and all across the state. Um, having people who can see a, a large picture of what's going on and being able to, for me, 
be a point person who they can call and say, I have this going on, uh, what can I do? Um, so finally, understanding how to meet the mental health needs of students and staff is not a new concept to us. Unfortunately, the pandemic has exacerbated the existing issues and made it more apparent than ever that support for mental health and well being is not disconnected from education. Rather, it's an essential component of students and staff being successful. Um, teaching is extremely rewarding, but also exhausting. Um, as you know, we are more than teachers, we are therapists, we're social workers, we're nurses all at once. Anything we can do to prioritize educator wellness and keep our wonderful caring people in the profession is essential. essential. Um, the proposed lead positions are a start towards prioritizing our mental health of our students and staff in order for teachers to teach and students to learn everyone's mental health and well-being needs to be balanced. Thank you for listening. Thank you for inviting me today to share our story. Um, and I just appreciate your time. Thank you. Oh, she already left. Okay. Um, but I'm still I here. See, yeah. Um, <laughs> make sure you reach out to that teacher that's contemplating um, leaving the profession um, and let her know or him know that um, hopefully um, after a lengthy decades long career, this will just be one of the blips on the screen and um, they'd, they'd be grateful that you reached out and kept them in the classroom for another year or two um, or forever for that matter. So um, anyways, thanks for mentioning that one teacher that's struggling. Next testifier, Sarah Holmbo. Yes, hello. You hear me okay? Yes, we can. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Um, I'm really um, happy to be here today. My name is Sarah Holmbo, and I am the Early Childhood Family Education Coordinator for the Centennial School District. I coordinate um, early childhood family education classes, preschool programming, and early childhood screening. And I'm also a licensed parent educator. This year, we have seen a huge increase in the mental health needs of, of our preschool age students in particular. They are exhibiting really concerning behaviors and have really underdeveloped social emotional skills. And research shows that ongoing toxic stress weakens the architecture of the developing brain. And knowing that 90% of brain development brain development happens before age five, we are in a position where supporting children's mental health is crucial for long-term health and well-being. Um, kids can't learn when they're experiencing high amounts of stress. So when we lower stress and improve mental health, we really raise that engagement and learning that students can do in the classroom. In early childhood, we are often the first point of contact for families at the school district. Um, when we see mental health concerns arise, whether that's through our early childhood programming and classes or through early childhood screening, we become the ones to help families access mental health resources and navigate that process um, of accessing affordable mental health services. So we build relationships with families. We help break down the stigma around mental health. We help families understand why their child might need and benefit from mental health services. We make referrals and explain how to access services, but we struggle what to do in the meantime if there's a wait list for services. And right now, um, especially across the state, but especially in our county as well, there are very long wait lists for services. And we try to answer questions parents have about how to pay for services, if insurance would cover those costs, but it's very complex and um, the situation just really varies depending on the provider and the family's needs. And for non-native English speakers, this process is even more daunting. Um, and schools have very limited resources to help families navigate all of this. We might hire or contract with mental health professionals. We make referrals for those services, but we are not experts on mental health. Um, like Kathy, my colleague, um, said, um, we do kind of it all in, in our districts and we can't be experts in everything. Um, this is one more thing that we add to our plates as educators, but we often feel unequipped to, to do that. 
So this bill would, um, for a lead position, would really be one of the pieces of the bigger puzzle of supporting mental health for students and staff. It would help us better understand what resources are available for families, um, how to help us help families access those resources. It would help us better support families through that referral process, through the evaluation process. And it really helps us identify best practices to implement in the classroom to help align what's best practice for kids and what we can do in the classroom as well. So thank you for um, your time. Thank you for your support of this bill. Um, and we appreciate being able to testify on this important topic. Thank you so much for that testimony. Before we open it up for comments and questions, um, I failed to um, vote on the author's amendment, the A1 amendment. So all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? OK. Six. Questions, comments, members? Senator Bolden. I don't have a question, just more of a comment and a uh, note of gratitude for bringing this bill forward. I will say as I have conversations with folks in my district, um, as I talk to parents and educators and mental health practitioners and students, without fail, every conversation includes uh, the challenges around mental health right now. And so this is needed as evidenced by the testimony that we have heard, but I imagine that we have all heard um, you know, from our folks in our districts um, just the need for this. And so thank you for bringing this forward. Mr. Chair, Senator Bolden, thank you. Um, I, I also heard this um, from just uh, both in my profession and um, the, over the summer. It is something that I don't think we can wait on much longer. And I also want to, as we sit here and talk about mental health and talk about suicide, I, I just, before we go on, want to mention too that um, we have a new really easy to remember hotline available to the state for anybody who is um, in crisis. Uh, it is 988. And uh, I know for younger, um, our younger people, sometimes texting is easier. You can text home to 741-741. I just want to make sure that's on the record as we're sort of talking about this. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Kunish. Thank you, Mr. Chair and um, Senator Gustafson. Um, this is really something so absolutely important that we have to have to address and we have to take some bold action towards. It's not just our students, but it's the staff, it's the administrators, it's the bus drivers, it's our you know food um, providers, it's it's our, the world that we live in right now. And if we are expecting students to perform at top rates, um, we have to address their, their social, emotional, mental um, needs. And unfortunately, we just don't have those in our state. And we haven't had them for a while due to lack of investment and intentional uh, resourcing. So uh, I really feel that this is an all-time important um, bill and uh, legislation that we need to, to, uh, to support, especially when we talk about comprehensive school mental health services. And uh, the nurse can't do it, the counselors can't do it, the teachers can't do it uh, alone. We really have to take an all hands on deck approach, um, not only supporting our adult uh, folks in the school system, but also our children, especially as they start to move through the system. So thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Kunish. Senator May Quaid. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I, I really want to lift up what my colleagues have said and, and Senator Gustafson, what you've said as well. And I think, you know, uh, one of the things that we know is that even in the last few years, like we've all experienced these things. And I think about the spaces we've created as adults to come together, to have conversations, to seek out care. Um, you know, when I was working outside the legislature, we'd often have our meetings and we'd start with check-ins and, and all of those things and, and making sure that students have this and that the adults in the building have resources that they can access because we're all in this new world, right? We didn't uh, all of a sudden wake up with all the knowledge on how to handle this mental health crisis. And so this is, like Senator Kunish said, like 
bold to make sure that we are actually addressing the whole need and uh, making sure our students have what they need to, to learn, right? They can't learn, can't learn if you're in crisis. So I'm just, I'm really, really grateful that this is a priority of the governor, is a priority of yours, and that we're hearing about this because, my goodness, if I, you know, if you do school visits and you talk to students, they'll say, they'll tell you about their mental health and they will tell you that they're struggling. And so this is just, I mean, so exciting. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Seeing no other questions or comments, um, I just want to thank you. On a personal note, I, I would implore our 201 fellow members in the legislature to meet with their social workers and their counselors and their school therapists and their teachers because as well as the kids, they're hurting. And in my 33 years of teaching, I, I don't recall uh, maybe three or four teachers that were struggling with their future as a teacher or a school nurse or counselor or social worker or therapist. And um, when you do talk to the counselors, you're going to find out that suicidal ideations are through the roof. And you're going to find out kids have to wait a month or two um, to see a therapist and on and on and on. And I don't, I hope if uh, out of this session, we've got a lot of, we're going to do a lot of great work in policy and finance. And, but I hope at the end of the day, um, a year or two down the pike that our kids are back on their feet and, and life is good and they're ready to learn and the teachers are ready to teach and our schools return to a sense of normalcy, whatever that means in education, as you know. And so thank you, Senator. Um, we're going to send it to finance. Ed Finance. Ed Finance, sorry. Yep. Um, we're going to send your bill to Ed Finance. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Thank you, Senator Gustafson. Thank you. Um, before we discuss the next bill, um, it was brought to my attention that um, that the communication going out about this hearing wasn't um, as well as as well received or in that's open to interpretation um, when the message went out so I looked into it and I found out that um, it was online the announcement for today's hearing was online on Friday and it was on the list server at Monday at 9:38 and personal update was at four o'clock yesterday so that's my knowledge of the timeline of the announcement of this meeting today from what it was relayed to me. To anybody that feels they didn't receive this in a timely fashion, would you please contact me and let me know um, so we can correct the errors of our ways. This is all new territory for me. I've never done anything like this before in my life and I'm, the learning curve is rather steep, but I certainly, in, um, if anybody has known me for six years knows that I'll make every, um, um, not every attempt, but many attempts at um, trying to reach across the aisle when possible. So with that said, um, we're going to hear next Senate File 619. The Senator Kunish, you're up. Senator Abler wanted me to remind everybody the old college try. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Abler. Senator Kunish, do you need a list of testifiers so you know the order? Um, I, if you'd like it. I think I'd love to. Senator Kunish, Senate File 619. Thank you, Mr. Um, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm very pleased this afternoon to present to you uh, Senate File 619. This is an incredibly comprehensive bill that aims to increase our teachers of color and indigenous within um, our school system. Um, I have been an author for four times on this bill, um, going back to my time in the House as well as um, to this year here. So um, I'm hoping that fourth time is a charm. 
uh, we have to remember that representation matters. Our youth and their families are yearning and asking for more representation in the teaching workforce that reflects our students. Research is clear that all students, all students benefit from our teachers of color. The proposed policies in this bill are essential to closing the persistent and unacceptable opportunity um, and achievement gap. And the policies and the provisions in this bill are crucial to ensuring a strong return on our state investment. It is uh, really important to know that there are members on both sides of the aisle that have authored this bill. Um, I think Senator Duckworth, Duckworth and Senator Abler, you were both authors of this bill, so you should be well versed on it. So in 2016, a year before the first increase of Teachers of Color Act was introduced, Republicans had a majority in the House and Democrats had um, the majority in the Senate. They then agreed to amend several statutes saying that all students shall be provided, and this is quote, improved and equitable access to effective and diverse teachers, end of quote. Those that reflect the diversity of our children in schools, and yet we heard in this com uh, committee from Pelsby's presentation on January 9th that there is a widening racial gap that still persists between our students and our teachers. Even though there has been a slight increase in the percent of BIPOC teachers since 2015, going from 4.2% to 6.2%, there hasn't kept pace with the increase of BIPOC, uh, BIPOC students in the state who are anywhere between 31 and 37%. Members, the hole we are in is deep and it's getting deeper. We must take comprehensive and bold, yet really truly common sense action as proposed in this bill to achieve better outcomes. These proposals have been bipartisan supported in the past. The vast majority of this year's bill policy are from the 2021 and 22 increase Teachers of Color Act, which were led by Senator Abler and Senator Duckworth and Senator um, Eichhorn as co-authors in, in 2021, and Senator Rarick was a co-author in 2022. I really want to thank you gentlemen and the others for their leadership in this um, effort, especially Senator Abler, Abler, who carried three previous versions, three previous versions of this bill from 2022, as well as Senator Nelson, who led the very first, the very first in 2017, Increased Teachers of Color Act. In addition to bipartisan lawmaker support, the proposed policies in this bill have also been vetted and supported by more than 50 education and community organizations over the years as part of the grassroot nonpartisan coalition to increase teachers of color and American Indians. These policies promote systemic change that we need along with increased investments in order to significantly and steadily increase the percentage of BIPOC uh, teachers. Uh, I'm gonna point out some of the key policies. Um, I hope that you all took the time to read through this bill. It's a very comprehensive. There's a lot of information, but honestly, if you've been here before, um, there's not much that has changed. So the key policy proposals include establishing an official state goal for annual increases to the percentage of BIPOC teachers so that by 2040, our teaching workforce reflects our student population. We want to strengthen the world's best workforce and the achievement and integration program statutes that require district strategic plan to address various opportunity gaps. This bill will strengthen various grant programs, including the Collaborative Urban and Greater Minnesota Educators of Color grant program to meet the recommendations of the Office of the Legislative Auditor in 2021. We want to remove the barriers of license exams that don't predict effective teaching and have contributed to the overall teacher shortage in the state by keeping thousands of effective teacher candidates of all races out of our classrooms over the years. 
This bill will prohibit discrimination against teachers for teaching about people from protected classes. And it prohibits American Indian school mascots. And we heard that bill. No, that was not the one that we heard the other day, was it? Nope. Um, but it prohibits American Indian school mascots and affirms the right of American Indian students to wear tribal regalia at graduation ceremonies. And that was the bill we heard on Monday. It requires principals to be um, evaluated for cultural responsive leadership, and it requires school districts to report to the state their number of teacher hires and termination by race and ethnicity. This good idea in section 12 and 15 was actually first proposed by House Minority Leader um, Representative Damuth just last year and is one difference in this bill compared to last year's bill. So I'm very excited to present this bill here to you today. We will be centering on the voices of BIPOC teachers and youth with special testifiers both here and remotely. I hope that their calls and the information that you are going to hear today will persuade you to join me in supporting this historic and it will be a truly transformative bill and vote to refer Senate File 619 to the Education Finance Committee for further action. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. So we'll begin with the testifiers. All right. There's my list. All right, to begin, um, uh, um, uh, Sarah Lancaster. Um, Senator, do you have an oh. amendment, an I, author's amendment? I do not have an author's amendment. Oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. I was not ready for that. Um, I do believe I have the, is it the A1? And that is the one that, oh, there we go. Thank you. Sorry about that, everyone. Yes, the A1, and this is the one um, to delete Section 8 and insert um, new language under the American Indian mascot um, prohibition. And so um, I ask with that that you will take my amendment. So you, uh, we will. Um, all those in favor of the author's amendment say aye. 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 All those opposed? Proceed. Beg your pardon on that, everyone. All right, so to begin with, um, we have um, Sarah Lancaster. Is she there? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yep. Perfect. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Sarah Lancaster, and I'm a first grade teacher at Onamia Public School District 480. Um, and in addition to educating the youth for the last decade at Onamia, I have also have the esteemed honor of currently serving as the 2022 Minnesota State Teacher of the Year. Um, the critical need to increase the population of Black, Indigenous, people of color, or BIPOC teachers is an issue that resonates very strongly with me, being the only licensed teacher of color in my entire school district. As a 2009 Onamia High School graduate myself, it's not easy to forget the feelings of isolation when I attended elementary and high school in Onamia. The magnitude of silence and not having one single teacher or person that I could connect with of color often felt like it was only heard by my ears alone. And when we think about teaching, we must remember that there are multiple ways to show up for our students. It's impossible for one person or one type of person to show up for every child. And in order to provide rich learning experiences for all of our students, we must ensure that the population of educators is as beautifully diverse as the students we teach. <clears throat> Excuse me. Experiences like the day when a young student with dark radiant hair walked into my classroom and she looked at me with these big coffee colored eyes behind these purple rimmed glasses. And after the school day had ended, her mom called me on the phone and her mother was in tears. And I was nervous and hesitant about what I might hear because sometimes the feelings of my littles can be very big. And it's my job as their teacher to not only reassure my students, but also their families. And that mother's tears brought forth words that even the memory of today can still take my breath away. Her words were that 
her daughter's first words off the bus returning home was that her teacher looks just like her and that she's beautiful. And their gratitude is still felt today for being able to give her daughter a gift she has never otherwise received. And as we know, the percentage of K-12 BIPOC students in Minnesota is 37% and steadily increasing each year. Since there are roughly 63 educators in our state, if our teachers reflected our students today, that means we would have 23,300 BIPOC teachers in our classrooms. However, we only have about 3,000 BIPOC educators, one of which is here before you, imploring you to support Senate File 619 so that we can do more to engage all students and close some of the worst opportunity and achievement gaps in the country. The policies proposed in the Increased Teachers of Color Act are needed to address the multiple interconnected factors contributing to the severe and continuous shortage of BIPOC teachers in schools. This bill helps create a better future of education, one as radiant as that little girl who ran off the bus to tell her mother about our long dark hair, our brown eyes and tan skin. Moments like these, breathtaking and incredible, are happening all across our classrooms, all over the state. And as the representative of educators in the great state of Minnesota this year, I'm so proud and honored to give these amazing moments a voice and to make sure we are heard not only in our classrooms, but beyond. Now it is your turn to give a voice to all of the prospective teachers of color and American Indian teachers just waiting to enter and hoping to remain in our classrooms. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today and I thank you for your time. Um, Ms. Lancaster, thank you. Um, for that testimony and thank you for being, uh, well, uh, congratulations on Teacher of the Year. For somebody that knows how rigorous that process is, um, that's quite an honor. And out of the, um, what, 85,000 teachers to be number one among all those, um, that's quite an accomplishment. I hope you stay on, on this call if you can till the end so in case anybody else wants to congratulate you or, or have a question for you. Next testifier is Ozamali Abisakin. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Come here, sweetheart. Take a seat. Thank you for being here today. Say hello. My name is Ozamali Obishakin. You can begin, thank you. Mr. Chair and members, my name is Osmali Obishakin. I am a fourth grader at Riverview Elementary School. I am here to ask for you to increase teachers of colors in our school. Let's say there's a new kid in class and he is black. He may not feel comfortable because he has just moved. He may also not feel comfortable with his new teacher and classmates because they don't look like him. That's how I felt sometimes at my old school in rural Minnesota where there was not very many people who looked like me or had things in common with my culture. Last year at my old school, I was sitting with a friend on my bus. All of a sudden, I hear someone poking me on my head. I said, please stop. She popped up. It was a preschooler, and she said, oh, you're black. You're poor, and you don't even look nice. You look like poo. You don't have any money for food or water. I said, that's not true. I do have the money for food and water. She said, that wasn't true. You're lying because you just want to be like me. She wouldn't leave us alone. So I told the bus driver and he said, okay, I'll talk to her. But he never did. When I told this bus driver who was white, he didn't know what to do because he has never experienced this. When my counselor and principal learned what happened, they congratulated me. This really disturbed me. But when I told my dad, he could relate on what happened because he was bullied due to racism. A similar incident happened at my new school where a friend was being excluded because of her race. The teachers handled it right away and had us meet with the school counselors so they can help us out with our feelings. At my new school, they knew how to handle difficult situations because there are more teachers of color. Please pass the Teachers of Color Act so more kids can feel happy in their schools. Thank you. Thank you for that testimony, and you're a very brave young woman. 
Mr. Chair, I just thank you for coming. Senator Abler, please do. Yeah, she was simply amazing. So and, and brave, and I thank you. I'm sorry that happened, by the way. I think we all need to take a collective um, breath or whatever the phrase is. Um, thank you again. Um, is as a Molly. Is that your mother? Would you like to yell out her name? Katya. Oh. oh, okay. Well done. Next up is um, Siddharth. <laughs> Siddharth Gazula. Thank you. Thank you to the chair and members of the committee. My name is Siddharth Gazula, and I'm a senior at Wyzetta High School in Plymouth. I represent Congressional District 3 on the Minnesota Youth Council. Over the past 13 years attending the Wyzetta School District, I've never been taught by a teacher who resembles my South Asian ancestry and heritage. While this lack of representation produces a wide range of issues, such as discouraging BIPOC students like myself from pursuing a career in education among the nation's worst teacher shortage, I'm here today to specifically address this issue's effect on receiving a diverse, well-rounded education, which highlights the true diversity of human experience, especially in ethnic studies curriculum. From endless analyses of George Washington's farewell address to detailed debates on Jackie Kennedy's impact on 60s fashion, American historical education for me has emphasized the stories of a select few. We're taught to trace the trajectory of our own paths from the experiences and expertise of these notable figures. Although there's undeniable value in learning from American real politics, we truly lose the diversity, cultural nuances, and unique stories from our own peers and teachers that make up our shared history. Last year, my school was named one of just 50 schools across the entire nation and Minnesota's only school to participate in the College Board's Exclusive Advanced Placement, or AP African American Studies pilot. This means that my school tests and provides feedback on the AP African American Studies curriculum before the class is implemented on a more widespread scale across the nation. As someone interested in pursuing a degree in history and social studies, I was thrilled when I received this exciting opportunity to make history and gain exposure to some of history's most marginalized perspectives. However, my, my school was unable to find a teacher of color to uh, guide instruction and resorted to hiring a white teacher for this inaugural class. On the first day of class, rather than delving into the rich history of ancient Africa in Unit 1, my teacher had to explain why she should not be leading this class. Although I greatly enjoy the class and my amazing teacher, if Minnesota's largest public high school of nearly 3,800 students is unable to provide the perspective from an African-American teacher to teach a course on African-American studies, just imagine the prevalence of this issue across schools within the Twin Cities and greater Minnesota. Bypassing Senate File 619, students like myself will gain exposure to ethnic studies from underrepresented teachers who are able to provide invaluable perspectives and support on social issues that matter most. It is vital to provide these perspectives of teachers of color in classroom instruction, which is why Senate File 619 must be passed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next testifier is Marsara Dunbar. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Good afternoon. My name is Masara Dunbar, and I'm a senior at Parnassus Preparatory School in Maple Grove and representative of the 5th Congressional District on the Minnesota Youth Council. I'm honored to give my testimony of support for Senate File 619 of the Inteach Increased Teachers of Colors Act. As a youth, a part of the BIPOC community, and a resident of Brooklyn Center, I am surrounded by a multitude of people that look like me. However, this changes once I enter the classroom. Though there are people and students just like me in my classrooms over the past couple years that have increased, there has not been any increase of teachers in this way. For the past 13 years of my school career, I've only needed one hand to count the amount of BIPOC teachers and student leaders and school leaders that I have come across. 
Though I greatly appreciate the work that all my current and past teachers have put in to ensure I get the education that I deserve, I believe that Senate File 619 of the Increased Teachers of Colors Act is crucial within our schools. This would not only benefit BIPOC teachers and help them to find a place within our schools and get the support they deserve, but it would also support BIPOC students to see themselves reflected in school leadership and be inspired to pursue a teaching career of their own in the future. With BIPOC teachers, there would be an opportunity to close the gap and allow situations to be talked out rather than resorted to what the system usually does, which is expulsion and suspension. Personally, during the events of the 2020 and 2021 protests surrounding the deaths of George Floyd and Dante Wright, I had to miss a number of school days. I wish I had teachers just like me that could personally understand the toll and the mental trauma that these events took on me. Represent representation matters, and because of that, I strongly support Senate File 619, and I urge you to do the same. Thank you, and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Next up is Shannon Geshek. Miigwech. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Shannon Gijic. It's an Ojibwe word that means cedar. I am a citizen of the Boys Fort Band of the Minnesota Chippewa Tribes, and I serve as the Executive Director of the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council. As our councils have done every year since 2017, we are here to share a united message from the three state ethnic councils and the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council in strong support of the Increased Teachers of Color Act, Senate File 619 as our top joint priority in education. As state agencies, an important charge is to advise and inform state lawmakers about our constituent communities and their needs. As you heard from the youth who testified, they are yearning for more teachers who they can relate to racially ethnically and culturally. However, this gap between the increasing diversity of students in schools and the lack of diversity of teachers widens each year. Addressing this severe shortage is key to narrowing our state's persistent opportunity and achievement gaps, which disproportionately impact our communities. Like previous iterations of this bill, Senate File 619 will strengthen policy to help ensure a greater return on state investment and address systemic barriers to recruiting, preparing, and retaining teachers of color and American Indian teachers. It is a comprehensive set of policy proposals, most of which were heard in this committee last year and incorporated in your ominous bill last session, but they didn't make it in the final omnibus bill. These proposals have been informed by feedback from hundreds of parents, students, educators, and others from our communities over the past eight years. As in years past, we are pleased that legislators from both parties are co-sponsoring the act in the Senate and that dozens of education organizations have experienced their endorsement, I'm sorry, have expressed their endorsement despite having strong disagreements on other pieces of legislation. The councils, our communities, and the coalition have a sense of urgency on this issue as our, stu our students' learning continues to be impeded by structural and systemic challenges that have only been exacerbated by the pandemic and have worsened the state's wide opportunity and achievement gaps. Over the course of the pandemic, our families have expressed that the policy language included in this bill 
could have been mitigated a number could have mitigated a number of the communication issues and lack of support they experienced during shifts to and from distance learning. It's important that this bill would require districts to have plans to ensure that curriculum is rigorous, accurate, anti-racist, and culturally sustaining, and that learning and work environments validate, embrace, affirm, and integrate the cultural and community strengths for all students, families, and employees. These strengthened plans will be critical in addressing the wide-ranging impact that COVID-19 has inflicted on student learning. Students' mental health has been suffering these past three years, even more than before the pandemic and the current events. More, more than ever, it's important for students to have teachers who understand racial and generational trauma and who can provide the support they need to deal with their mental health and to be successful in school. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next testifier. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Buenas tardes. My name is Katia Cepeda and I am the um, I am the Legislative and Policy Director in Education for the Minnesota Council on Latino Affairs. Research has, research has clearly demonstrated that all students benefit from diverse teachers. Research is also clear that gaps narrowed for students who are of color or American Indian who have teachers reflecting their diverse backgrounds. We must be responsive to their needs. Together we can and must change the trajectory for those students. Many schools across the state are struggling to stay open due to daily workforce shortages. This bill will not only address the shortage of teachers of color and American Indian teachers, but increasing teachers from our communities will address the overall workforce teacher shortage in our schools. Our councils and communities have called for racial justice in all aspects of society. If we are to expect different results in our effort to narrow our achievement gaps, we must do things differently as a state and address opportunity gaps. In this regard, Senate File 619 represents significant positive change that will make a difference in the lives and learning of our students. We strongly recommend that your committee fully support all of the policy language in the 2023 T Increased Teachers of Color Act. We appreciate the leadership demonstrated by Chair Sawinski to prioritize hearing this bill and Senator Kunish for serving as our lead author. Thank you for your leadership in doing what is right for all students in Minnesota. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you. Next up. Janet Freeberg Lawson on hybrid. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Oh. Okay, thank you. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Janet Freeberg Lawson and I'm an English teacher at Park Center Senior High School, where I am right now at my desk uh, in the Osseo School District. I'm speaking to you not only um, from the perspective of a person of color who has been a teacher since 1993, but also um, as a parent of four children. It's no secret uh, that there are a few of us in this profession. Most of my experience has been one of isolation and singularity. I started my teaching career at an alternative school in Minneapolis for seven years, and then I taught for two and a half years as an EBD teacher in the St. Paul uh, School District before I landed here at Park Center where I've been for the last 23 years. Um, the majority of the students that I have taught all these years have been students of color. This is one of the reasons why I've continued to be a teacher and not sought a higher paying salary job. Uh, we know that students of color do better when they have teachers of color in front of them. However, uh, this concept is parallel to the isolation and singularity that I have experienced being a teacher of color in that I alone feel that I am um, encouraging my students to be teachers in a world that is constantly, constantly making teachers, especially teachers of color, feel alone and isolated as professionals. I am grateful to see the Increase in Teacher of Color Act address the barriers that keep people from considering teaching as a career. Um, the interconnectedness of the factors that contribute 
to the lack of people of color becoming teachers is a complicated mess of systematic, excuse me, systemic inequalities that have trickled down into a consciousness that I think is ingrained in the psyche of how we collectively think about teaching. For example, I teach five classes this trimester. One of them, or two of the sections of those five, um, is an African-American literature class. Both of these classes are completely made up of students of color. And to prepare for this testimony, I just asked my students if any of them were considering being a teacher. Out of the about 55 students I have in both sections, only one of them said that they were interested. I asked them why not, and the replies that I received mostly stated that teachers are not respected and they don't get paid enough. In closing, it is no big surprise that my children have not had many opportunities to be taught by teachers of color, except when they have had to be in my own classroom, which has all of them have had to be, uh, because they go to school in the district where I teach. Um, this has also afforded me the ability to make sure that they are with teachers who I know will nurture and see them as the individual learners uh, that they are with their diverse learning styles. However, I've had the luxury of knowledge of the system that many parents don't have, let alone parents of color. So please support this act, which creates an opportunity for more teachers of color to cultivate and grow so that the needs of many of the students of color can be met. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next up is Kimyata Lewis, hybrid. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and Chair members. My name is Kimiata Lewis and I have worked in special education setting for school as a para for the past 16 years. In these 16 years, I have been the only staff of color. 60% of our students of color, 60% of our students are of color. The students of color say to me all the time things like, Ms. Lewis, how come there are not more black staff here? Ms. Lewis, how come you're not a teacher? I want to be in your class. Ms. Lewis, I think the principal is racist because there are not enough black staff in the building. Thankfully, this school year, the school has hired four more pairs of color. I no longer feel alone and students are more supported. I must say that it feels good to know that when I walk through the door in the morning, I will not be the only staff of color in the building. But there are still no licensed teachers of color in our school, and that's not right. I have experienced and observed racism many times over my career in education. This bill is important because it expects school and districts to address institutional racism and endure that quote, learning and work environments validate, affirm, embrace, and integrate culture and community strengths for all students, families, and employees. For a long time, my reasons for not pursuing a teaching degree and further in my education was because lack of autonomy and coaching from what, what I've seen over the past 16 years. However, I've changed my mind about my educational and professional goals. The students that I speak of here today are the reason that I finally decided to go back to school to become a special education teacher. I am enrolled in MSU Mankato to earn my degree and license as part of the Teachers of Tomorrow program. I think it is very important for our students to have a black educator for a teacher one day. And all I can do on this journey is pray and hope a change will come in education. Please fully support the increase of Teachers of Color Act so important changes will happen that lead to increased percentages of teachers of color that we need in our schools. Thank you. Thank you. And we do have one last added testifier, um, Yelena Bailey. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, thank you for having me here. My name is Dr. Elena Bailey. I am the Interim Executive Director of Pelsby. For the past several years, Pelsby, uh, the board members have voted unanimously to support the Increased Teachers of Color Act. And I'm here today just to highlight a few of the provisions that the board is especially supportive of. The first item we want to bring to your attention is the establishment of state goals and reporting around diversifying our teacher workforce. Currently, we have students family members, community members who've been advocating for the need to increase our teacher diversity in the state. You've heard from, the, from Senator Kanish the need to rectify the gap between our students' uh, diversity and our teacher diversity. The state does fund several programs that work towards this goal that are housed at the Department of Education, the Office of Higher Ed, as well as our agency. 
What this bill would do would coordinate and collaborate those efforts, which the board believes would help increase their impact significantly and also help with transparency so that the members of the state can see the good work that's being done here. The second provision we'd like to highlight is the remover of teacher licensure exams for those individuals who've completed teacher preparation in the state. Um, right now we have about a third of our individuals who have completed teacher preparation and hold a tier two license because they cannot pass their licensure exams and almost 40% of those individuals are teachers of color. We know that teacher preparation in the state is rigorous and that research shows very little or actually no correlation between those exams and preparedness or capacity to succeed in the classroom. So Pelsby fully supports the removal of those exams. The third item we'd like to highlight are the changes and uh, language to the Collaborative Urban and Greater Minnesota Educators of Color Grant. In 2021, the OLA audited us on that grant and provided a recommendation for clarity around the purpose of that language. The provisions of this bill would actually make those changes as well as increase funding. Having spent time personally visiting each of those grantee institutions, hearing from the candidates that are in those programs about the wonderful work being done to support them, I can say wholeheartedly that increasing that funding would go a long way to help support and induct more teachers of color into our profession. The last item I'd like to highlight is changes to the teacher mentorship and retention grant. We are hearing anecdotally across the state from districts, both in the metro and in greater Minnesota, of the great work that's being done to mentor and retain our teachers, particularly our teachers of color. So the changes here in the administrative language and funding would again increase that impact. So I'd close by saying that Pelsby fully supports the provisions in SF 619 and encourages committee members to support it as well. Thank you. Thank you. And lastly, Megan Ariola. Department of Education. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Megan Ariola. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the legislative coordinator with the Minnesota Department of Education. Um, nothing we will be saying here is anything that hasn't been said so well by the students and teachers who you've heard from today, but um, I do want to thank you for just allowing me some time to provide some brief comments on a number of the policy sections in Senator Kanesh's bill that will align with policy language we have carried in the past and will be in the governor's policy bill for this year as well. I would also like to thank Senator Kunesh for um, accepting the amendment we had asked her to adopt um, after some consultation with our tribal nations and our Office of American Indian Education, we had a few uh, changes to make to the language, so thank you for adopting that. Setting a state goal for increasing the percentage of teachers of color and American Indian teachers and ensuring students have access to teachers who reflect the diversity of the state is a common sense goal we should all adopt. We know that all students do better when they have access to more diverse teachers. Many of these proposals provide supports, expectations, goal setting, and aspirations around creating a more inclusive and affirming teaching and learning environment. Uh, modifications to statutes on the world's best workforce plans, evaluation and development, and achievement and integration programs recognize a commitment to a more culturally responsive and inclusive environments that will support all of the systems and programs in place and benefit our students and the staff. As more and more teachers report feeling vulnerable or afraid to teach a well-rounded and accurate account of their subject area for fear of disciplinary actions, we absolutely appreciate the Senator adopting language that the Governor has carried uh, for a number of years, providing statutory protections for teachers providing instruction on federally protected classes of people. Finally, we're happy to see uh, several of the proposals around um, American Indian education experience in Minnesota, including the mascots prohibition uh, that I mentioned earlier, as well as the right of American Indian students to wear tribal regalia at graduation ceremonies, which we heard about earlier this week. Um, these policy changes would make important and far past due changes to affirm the identities and the uh, existence of our American Indian students, families, and their tribal nations. Uh, again, thank you so much for the opportunity to provide some support for these provisions. Thank you, and I appreciate members for your patience as we went through all the testifiers. Senator Abler. Just a question, I'll make my comments a little bit later, but um, just curious if the school boards were gonna comment on this or if they've declined. I don't see the room full of them today, but I'm curious if they wanna say anything or if not, that's fine too, thanks. Any other members, questions, comments? 
Mr. Chair. S Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I do have uh, just a few questions regarding the bill. And I appreciate uh, uh, Senator Kunish kind of sharing some of the, the history and, and the path that this bill has been on over the course of a few different sessions. I think one of the names uh, was maybe missed in reference. Former Senator Chuck Weger, who I see in the audience, I know he's been a champion of uh, this bill as well in the past. So always good to see him here. Uh, and if memory, if memory serves, I do believe um, some aspects of the bill were passed, but of course not all of it. I think there was funding for uh, teacher shortage, loan repayment programs, grow your own, and come teach in Minnesota. Uh, things that were really focused on the intent of this bill, which is to hire and bring about more teachers of color into schools here in Minnesota. Uh, I don't think any of us would disagree with all the studies and information and research that shows that if you're a student of color, you tend to do better in the classroom and learn better and perform better uh, if you also have some teachers that are also teachers of color. And I think that's a, an important aspect of this bill. I think some th uh, one of the reasons why maybe the bill in its entirety hasn't necessarily passed previously uh, has to do with uh, some of the curriculum aspects that have been outlined in this bill. And so my first question gets to that. Um, you know, typically, at least here in, in Minnesota, the Minnesota Department of Education reviews and puts forward different standards for curriculum on a regular basis. It goes through a public input uh, and feedback process. And then we also rely on our local school boards and school districts to review and implement uh, curricul uh, curriculum. As it relates to some curriculum that's referenced in this bill, would that have to go through the same process, whether it be MDE or local school boards, or would we as a legislature be implementing and uh, legislating that curriculum? Um, thank you, Senator Duckworth. Would you mind telling me what, um, what area or what page you're looking at, what curriculum uh, information you're talking about? Mr. Chair, if I may. Uh, page two, lines 2.5, 2.13, 2.15, and 2.18. Uh, so 2.5 is talking about ethnic studies curriculum, and I do believe there is a bill that's coming forward um, to talk about that. So it would go through that process, the regular process through um, MDE. I'm sorry, which other ones were you, did you say? So below that, letters F, G, and H. F, G, and H. So within the um, ethnic study curriculum and the other curriculums that are coming forward as they are being reviewed and updated, they would be tasked with um, looking for any um, references to anti-racism. Um, we would ask that it would be uh, culturally sustaining, which means that the, the content and the practices infuses the culture and the language of our black, indigenous, and people of uh, color communities that have not been represented in the past in our curriculum. And then um, institutional racism. So making sure that any of these curriculums that are coming forward um, have looked for instances and possibly areas that we just didn't recognize as um, racist or um, uh, not supporting our communities of color, that we have a more focused view and are looking for any instances to eliminate those those um, those kind of harmful instruction or curriculum. Mr. Chair, if I may ask a follow-up. Thank you. Um, and so I think I heard part of your, your answer in reference to another bill is that the idea would be that, that this curriculum would have to come through the, the normal MDE curriculum process. I see Mr. Uni jumping up, so maybe he has some, some light to shed on this, if that's okay. If you'll indulge me, Mr. Chair, uh, and, and Senator Duckworth, thank you, uh, Senator Kunish. Uh, for the record, my name is Adosh Shuni. I'm the Director of Government Relations for the Minnesota Department of Education. Just wanted to provide some uh, clarification for uh, for the committee. The language in question, I think, on page two around ethnic studies curriculum is language that we're carrying in the department's policy bill, which you'll see in the future. I think we're getting that wrapped up. Thank you, Chair. Um, the the clarification is, is that curriculum is what districts put together at the local level. What the department is in charge of by statute is reviewing and revising, sometimes adopting, 
the standards, and then we also work on the benchmarks that are attached to standards. But curriculum is the kind of the portal or programming that districts locally adopt to deliver the standards and benchmarks um, that then, then are ultimately, uh, especially for literacy and math and science, are evaluated on our, our MCAs. But just want to provide a clarification for the committee that the department does not have a part to play on specific curriculum. Sometimes we are tasked with collecting model programs that then are may have links to curriculum or are used to develop curriculum at the local level, but that is really the purview of, of the uh, local education agency. Thank you. If I may, Mr. Chair, I'm going to assume I have. I can't, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Yes, Senator, continue sure. that line of discourse, <laughs> and, um, and I'll, I, I do allow leeway so we speed things up by not sounds good going through the chair. Knowing that, but I will interrupt if we don't perfect. follow procedure. Thank you, sir. I want to be respectful of you, of course, and and, and I know uh, you will be in our. Thank you. Uh, so, if I understood what you had to say correctly, Mr. Uni. As it relates to curriculum, specific to this one, which may be coming forward in another bill, the expectation will be, or the flexibility will still be afforded to local school districts to determine how to implement or what that curriculum may look like at, at their local level. Uh, correct. As I, read, as I read this bill and as it would be in the governor's policy bill, which we've, we've seen uh, this language before, uh, this sets uh, forward expectations of what an ethnic studies curriculum would mean. But in, there's, there's still plenty of room for districts to implement it the way they see fit with the, you know, the programming, the books, the textbooks that they would be, and other uh, exercise and activities they would be using to implement it. And it could be the case that maybe they already have aspects of their curriculum that, are, that would fall under this, potentially. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, Mr. Chair, my apologies. Yes, uh, one, one would hope. One would hope that yes, they've already implementing a lot of this. Okay, very good. If I may continue, Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, on page seven, uh, section six, it talks about curriculum policy, and it talks about a school board must adopt a written policy that prohibits discrimination or discipline for a teacher or principal on the basis of incorporating into curriculum contributions by persons in a federally protected class or a protected class under, and then it goes on to say some reference to law. Uh, so my question here is, uh, can a school district still use its best judgment regarding the content, however, they can't limit it based on who contributed to, it, who contributed to its creation? And I'm happy to, to try to expound upon that question if need be. Please, so my, sir. Th thank you. Um, so when we talk about districts and communities and maintaining local control, curriculum, what's being taught in the classroom, et cetera, the way I read this, this portion of the bill says that uh, essentially a district can't prohibit um, curriculum that have been, the contributions have been made to by persons of federally protected classes. And so to me that, that means if uh, someone of a protected class created some sort of content that would be used in a curriculum um, the fact that they contributed to it can't be used as the basis to not al allow for it. However, the school district still would be able to utilize their best judgment based on its content regardless of who created it as to whether or not they deem it appropriate for the classroom. Is there a question? That's my question, if, if that's the case. Are you seek, is it seeking to um, allow for all of that content, regardless of what the district may or may not think is appropriate, or is it simply based on who created or contributed to that content? I, I think it's a, it's both. You know, and the, I, the way it's written um, prohibits discrimination or discipline for a teacher or principal on the basis of incorporating into curriculum, so that we, um, so that teachers and um, those that are doing the instructions are not penalized for providing um, factual, actual information, but at the same time allowing the school boards to um, have some flexibility, as um, Mr. Uni said, in ensuring that the curriculum that they are providing does um, make sure that it is a well-rounded, non-racist, and informational uh, curriculum. If I may, Mr. Chair. 
I, the reason I ask the question is because to me, the way I read it, it doesn't necessarily have that degree of clarity. So whether you change that or, or adjust it in the future, obviously I'll leave to you as the author of the bill. But what I'm getting at is um, if, if, if this portion of the bill is not clear, what I could see it potentially doing, and maybe this is the intent of it, um, is preventing a local school board in consultation with their community from potentially uh, utilizing their best judgment to deem something that they might not find appropriate from the classroom from being presented in the classroom. And I don't mean to take us on a whole tangent. That could be a whole host of things for a whole yeah. host of good reasons. So my question is less to do with content than more to do with who actually created that content. Because the way I read it, it's saying you can't uh, prevent a teacher from presenting something in class based solely on who actually created the content not actually the, the, the course content itself. Uh, and I guess I'll just wrap it up with, with that in terms of how I'm potentially interpreting that section. If I may, Mr. Chair, I have some more like Pelsby related type questions. Mr. Thank Chair. you. Senator Makeway. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I might, to, to Senator Duckworth's point, I, I, you can absolutely go on after this, but the way that I'm reading this in section six is that um, school boards might they have to have a policy that doesn't allow discrimination or discipline for a teacher or principal for incorporating um, curriculum who, that's been contributed to by people of a protected class. So it's not that they can't have an opinion about that what's in it or have conversations about it or, or talk about it. It's just that they can't be disciplined for incorporating that in there. It has to be uh, not, not punishment, I guess, is what I'm reading. Is that correct? Yes. Thank Indeed. You. Thank you, Senator McQuaid. Senator Duckworth, continue. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate that nuance. And I, as someone who's had to sit in on, on some of those meetings, uh, unfortunately, um, having clarity when it comes to what we may or may not be allowed to discipline a teacher on is super important, which is why I bring up the, the, the question, so thank you. When I look to page 11, um, in, uh, the representative from Pelsby kind of talked about the removal of uh, having to take a test in terms of certain aspects of licensure. And so I just want to make sure I'm understanding this correctly. In lieu of potentially having to take that test, they would be required to complete a prep program. Is that, she's coming up here already. Is that my understanding, and in, in, is it in Pelsby's uh, expert opinion that that the, the prep programs that are authorized to uh, exempt somebody from having to take this test would meet whatever re you know, requirements you have for rigor and content, et cetera. Thanks for coming up to help. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Duckworth, that's a great question. So the language in this would be just for those individuals who do complete teacher preparation in Minnesota. So n not for everyone, um, but it would exempt them from the need to take the MTLEs. Um, and it is our opinion um, that because we are very aware as the body you've delegated to oversee uh, this, that teacher preparation provides the rigor and the, ne the need for candidates to demonstrate their capacity for success and their skills to demonstrate the standards of effective practice through performance-based assessment, that that meets those qualifications for rigor and that these exams are no longer necessary. Very good. Mr. Chair, if I may. Um, I know that in, in the past we've had conversations with Pelsby um, in relation to other aspects of teaching, whether it be short calls, substitutes, what have you, in trying to look at some of the requirements that are made of folks who would love to be in the classroom teaching. And so I applaud your efforts here to maybe look at some other common sense ways to help us broaden that. And I would encourage you to continue to utilize that, that mindset and approach uh, in other aspects of teaching as well. I know sometimes when I talk about that, I get in trouble because we don't want to obviously impact the quality of those who are teaching and we want to respect their education and licensure and, and experiences. Uh, but if there are, are other good common sense ways that expands or allows for other good quality folks to be in the classroom, I think that would be worthwhile and this might be a, a good example or illustration of that. Um, I'm also curious to know um, if there are, if anybody has any statistics or information they could share with us in, re in regard to the aspects of this bill that have been passed in the past. Have, are we seeing an impact? Are we getting more um, uh, persons of color stepping forward and pursuing education, showing up in the classroom and impacting our, our young people? Or what have we learned so far, if anybody 
has information or knowledge they can share regarding that. I would like to ask um, Mr. Spees to come up and, and share his experience in that realm. I can't believe we got this far without you testifying. Mr. Chair, Senator Duckworth, uh, thank you for the question. We have. Could you, sir, could you yourself, please? Please? Yes. My name is Paul Spees. Uh, I'm the legislative action team lead with the Coalition to Increase Teachers of Color, American Indian Teachers in Minnesota. Thank you for the question. Uh, we have made progress over the last few years, but it's just very small progress. As was stated earlier by a previous testifier, we've increased the percentage in Minnesota since 2017 from 4.2% to 6.2%. Candidates in our teacher prep programs have, uh, the percentage of BIPOC candidates is between 17 and 19% now of all teacher candidates. So those grow your own programs and other grant programs, uh, concurrent enrollment, all of those things are bubbling up and having some difference, but they're just small investments that we've made so far as a state and we need to make a lot more along with these policy changes that haven't been passed that are critical to have a return on those investments. Mr. Chair, uh, thank you for that information. I, I know that um, some of those aspects of, of this bill uh, have been passed fairly recently. So I'm hopeful we'll continue to, to see uh, increased teachers of color in the classroom, in the pipeline, et cetera. Um, again, and why I think I and others have supported this endeavor in the past is it's, it's worthwhile endeavor. Hopefully we can do it in, in ways in which are impactful, uh, that are making a difference in the classroom, in our schools, and for our kids. And uh, any other thoughts or consideration we can give um, to this important topic while also making sure we're including our school districts, uh, our communities, and um, uh, being cognizant of the curriculum they're implementing, I think that would also be uh, very important. So thank you. Thank you. Senator Bolden? Okay, I thought you had a question earlier. Oh. And, okay, Senator Abler? I thought the line was longer. Um, nice to see you, Paul. Anyway, and Senator Kunish, um, I uh, appreciate this bill a lot, and I have carried it a number of times and did the best we could there, Mr. Spees, and we got something with press conferences and so on about this. And I just think the testifiers have been amazing uh, uh, from the fourth grade group all the way on up, and I think she was particularly rocket science star person. Anyway. Um, so, and uh, if you notice, there's four authors on here, and there's a spot for me. Uh, Senator Kunish, thank you for bringing it to me, and we had a little chat. Um, this bill is, I think, close to being ready to go, and something that I think can be embraced. Um, I just have a, a couple of questions, and then a few comments about some of the syntactical uses of the language. Um, and so I appreciate, I think if you want to put a title on this one, this is certainly the, the biggest one. This is like teachers of color, we mean it. And, um, and we did not not mean it before, but now you're, anyway. So you've strengthened us some things and there's just a lot of good content. I appreciate protecting people for teaching what they think they should teach. I appreciate the give and take of this, you know, with the curriculum stuff with parents and the community and the teachers and, and um, just a couple little technical questions, then I'll just get into the bulk of my comments. I just noticed uh, that you're giving these um, um, some of these grants or bonuses to the tier three, four people, and I just want to remind my little observation that I thought was amazing, Mr. Chair, um, that the tier one had the most percentage-wise of people that have actually made it through, even though it's very small. And as we're trying to get more people to come into teaching that you just might want to not just have it for the upper level ones, but the people you're trying to get in the door and try to get them, that's just a, I think that I read that right, that it's limited to tier three and four on the scholarships or bonuses or whatever they are, so. Just a thought, um, and because the, uh, the workforce is becoming more and more competitive, there's a very finite number of human beings in Minnesota to take on any job, and particularly if you want to draw people into here, you just want to kind of make, make it easy, and I'm, 
I'm pretty happy that I, I think I signed the bill for allowing tier one teachers to voluntarily join collective bargaining to kind of solidify their role and maybe feel like they're more of a of the group there. So anyway, I appreciate that. Um, and so um, there's a lot of people who don't understand this topic very well. Um, there's, a, there's a couple of groups of people um, and I think the districts are generally on board, even though they didn't testify. And my district is on board with the concept of this. Uh, very often to the misunderstanding of some of the residents who don't understand what it is if you are catching my drift. Um, and so I think more people are friendly to this topic and would like to encourage it. If you, ask, if you tell it to them, like, do you think we should help everybody learn? Like, well, yeah. And how do you help them learn? You know, by, you know, experiencing you know, similarities and, you know, encouragements and, and all that. Um, but then you get into terms where people just get inflamed, which I don't think anybody means. And, um, and they become an unfriendly audience and they fill up school board meetings and they push on us to be opposed to something that actually, in my opinion, is extremely well intended. And so, um, just, uh, there's just a, a few terms in here which, um, as you work on your, the bill going forward, um, I would still love to co-author it. And so as I read it, there's a couple things I mentioned to you, Senator Kunish. Um, but just as an example, and I'll just, it's a committee, so we should talk here. And I, hopefully these are just friendly to you. Um, like on page two, uh, the term culturally sustaining. Um, <clears throat> if you put a period at the end of communities on line 216, it says the same thing. Um, and you don't really have to have the end of that line and the next line, um, unless you're trying to get people to go to a meeting. Um, and I, I don't think you need to say that part. I think because what, what you're trying to do is you're trying to infuse the culture and language, et cetera, of the communities in a, in a friendly way. And I'll continue a couple other choices. Even the term uh, anti-racist. Um, and I'm no expert on this, but when I first ran into that term, whenever that started being used some time ago, it's like, it just seemed harsh to me. And the, there's nobody I know who, it, it, just, it, it just tends to inflame as opposed to bring on board. And I know that as people use it in sentences and it prolifically today, um, but it, it may, there might be a better term that means identically that term, which gets you to the goal of getting more people to embrace this. And so as you, if your goal is to really help fourth graders learn and, uh, and succeed across every culture, there's just a way. And so um, by comparison, um, on line 5.24, uh, it talks about ensuring school environments and curriculum validated for embrace, integrate culture and community strengths of students, families, employees, small racial and ethnic backgrounds. That's a really nice sentence. People want that. Um, and, and, and that doesn't frighten anybody. Uh, but like on line 5.7, um, if you, after the word uh, chronically, it says favor white people and, uh, that would get someone's attention. But if you just deleted those couple of words and just, if you're talking about producing outcomes that chronically disadvantage those who are black, indigenous, et cetera, that's what you're really after, and then you don't divide. And this is probably a risky discussion to have in public in front of, but no one's watching. But, I, but it's my sincere effort that we bring people on board. My district had a horrifically large meeting, um, not understanding what they were trying to do. And you want to always try to bring people together. And so I like that you're talking about, in, in the curriculum policy, you're talking about the teachers. Please teach. Teach who you are, teach it from your perspective. Be yourself there, I, I think that's, that's really good. On line 8.21, it talks about, uh, 2.2, it talks about creating a positive school climate uh, uh, and to prevent and reduce discrimination other improper conduct. That's what we're after, those are kind of positive, affirming statements. Um, and I think that helps and um, now we talked about the tier licensing, and I'm almost done. But I, but I'm very friendly to this 
this bill. And I, on line 23.13, he talks about affinity groups, uh, from underrepresented racial and ethnic groups to come together throughout the school year. That's great language. Those are, that's language that brings people into the room and doesn't make them have a free meeting where they think they have to stop something that they're really afraid of. Um, and, you know, it talks about on line 2912 uh, to be culturally sustaining. I like that. I, I mean, we like that. This is, we want to, we don't want every culture to have to look like all the rest of us as something. And so, um, and so I think your goal ultimately on line 2921 is increases, I think if you put a purpose statement on top of the bill, it'd be to increase access, meaningful participation, representation, and positive outcomes for students of color and American Indian students. That's what I want. And so it, it's your bill, you'll do what you want. But I'm fearful, uh, I, I want to vote for the bill this is in because I want to vote for this. But I'm nervous if some of those other terms stay there that it will just be not as easy as that. And I would love to sign on to the bill sometime, Madam Chair. Or Madam, so I guess you're a Madam Chair too. So that's my thoughts. I hope you take them in the spirit that they're intended. So thank you. And I'm happy to hear your comments if you want. Well, you don't have to. Well, um, Senator Abler, I'm, I guess I'm not surprised by your comments and your seeming um, offense to some words that that you deem are harsh. Um, this bill is not here to whitewash any of the policies that we want to put forward. Uh, our teachers of color and indigenous teachers, our students of color have had to live with these sort of issues, racism, lack of cultural sustain, uh, sustaining, institutional racism. We've asked for changes for hundreds and hundreds of years. And we are naming what it is in this bill. And we are naming the intention of removing all of those things that get in the way of our kids succeeding at the same level as everybody else and of our teachers that, are, um, that have kept teachers of color out of the classroom. And um, I'm not gonna apologize for these words or the use of this language. We're not gonna dress it up and make it really pretty and non-threatening to people. If this, um, if this irritates people or causes them to have a negative reaction, that tells me that those things still exist. That they are not fully um, acknowledging and embracing the fact that within our school system, within our educational system, there is racism, that cultures are not fully embraced and acknowledged and um, taught with historical reverence and fact. And so um, I would not ever change those words. Um, and if it makes somebody uncomfortable and they don't want to sign on to the bill, then they're, they're probably not the right person to sign on to this bill. But we, I will not go back and whitewash any of those that language. Senator Hochschild. Mr. Chair. Oh. You want to refute or rebut? I don't want to rebut at all. I didn't come here to rebut. I didn't come here to be mean. I didn't come here to be anything. At the end of the day, you want to succeed in the goal to help everybody learn. Mm -hmm. And so I told you in a very risky public forum, in the kindest way I could tell you, that you can bring a lot of people on board who are already there who don't want to be pushed away just by how you say the sentence. Mm -hmm. That's my entire point. I am not, and we mentioned it privately, but I just think it's important here that all kinds of people want everybody to succeed and they're happy to be specific about helping groups that have been not enabled to do that, which is what this bill does. I put my name on three of these before with the same goal. That's all I'm after. And so if I need to apologize, I will, because I did not mean any disrespect and any of that. But just the smoother you can make the sailing of these changes that are going to hopefully pass, the better. That's all I'm saying. And the eye on the prize is extremely worthy and probably embraced by close to 100% of the people in this state. That's all. So I'll stop. Thank you. And the goal has not changed. 
The goal has never changed for this bill. It's to increase teachers of color. And um, that, that is our full intention and our full goal, and that's where we mean to go. Senator Hochschild. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Senator Kunish, for introducing this bill. Um, I could certainly talk a lot about why I'm in favor of this and uh, appreciate your efforts to bring it forward. I just wanted to talk a little bit about the amendment that you brought forward okay. and my um, strong support for that. Um, you know, I think it's really important that we note that it's unfortunate in our history and our school system um, that tribal logos have been predominantly used. Um, in our school systems, in our university systems, uh, despite other ethnic groups not being used in that way. Um, I was a student at the University of North Dakota, which had a prominent, well-known Native American logo, and I was working with the American Indian Studies group uh, to testify to the North Dakota legislator to remove that logo um, because of its offensiveness. Um, and so I'm really proud that, that we're moving forward with this in Minnesota as well. Um, you know, I think what makes schools, what makes our education system strong are not symbols. Um, it's the teachers, it's the students, it's the traditions that are created in those environments. Um, and while there is a lot of passion behind symbols and logos and, and those types of, of monikers, um, it is not in any way appropriate for us to be using um, a subset group of people uh, as, as you know, those types of, in those types of circumstances. So anyway, I just wanted to say thank you for that, and um, I'm glad that we're moving forward with that. Thank you. Thank you. I don't see anybody else. Oh, Senator May Quaid. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and Senator Kunish, I this is such a great bill, and, and we had the chance to work on it a little bit together in the House, too, and so I'm just, I'm really glad to see it. I'm, I'm glad to see how it's evolved, um, and I, I just think it's really wonderful. You know, I, I never had a black teacher. In all the years I went to school, I never had a black teacher, and my parents had to be my AP black history teachers. You know, I would go to school, and I would learn all about European history, and I'd learn a lot about white leaders, and I learned a lot about, you know, a student mentioned um, Jackie Kennedy's contributions to fashion. I learned a lot about that. I never learned about leaders who looked like me. I never learned about that history in school, and I, so I would go home and have more school. I learned about Fred Hampton, and I learned about the Black Panthers and how they created universal school meals and some gun control laws because they carried guns in California, right? And, and all of these things that I learned about from my family that I never learned about in school, and, and I keep thinking back to the summer of 2020, which was so traumatic for every single person. And the thing I heard over and over again from people in our communities was, I feel dumb because I didn't know. I didn't know, and I wish I knew. I wish I had learned about this. I wish there had been places for us to have these conversations. And it's not just students of color, it's white students too. And these, this is the world we are growing up in. And so um, I just think about what it would have been like to have a black teacher, just one black teacher. I never thought about becoming a teacher because I just literally, it like never occurred to me. People who look like me didn't become teachers. And so I am just really excited about this bill and I'm really excited to see it move forward. And I wanna thank you for your, your strong advocacy for it and for bringing it today. Thank you, committee. Um, before your final comments, I'd just like to add, you used the word transformative in your opening remarks, and that's what this bill's gonna do. It's gonna transform the lives of 850,000 students who have never had a teacher that they should have had. And I know I hate, I, I, I know I'm sounding like I'm, be, I'm what's the, ex, I'm beating a, what's the expression? Beating a dead horse, thank you for everybody that knew it. Um, but in my 31 years of teaching at one of the largest high schools in the state, and we had a department of 22 to 25 social studies teachers, the study of society, and during that 31 years, they came and went, so maybe 50 social studies teachers in the last 40 years can say they taught in Eden Prairie, Minnesota, and one of them was a teacher of color. And I just find that so sad of a loss for all those students that came through that building over the last um, 
during my tenure that never had a teacher that looked like them teaching the concept of studying of our society. So I can't thank you enough for bringing this forward. And it sounds like we've done it. I love that Senator Abler said, this time we mean it, it needs to be in the uh, byline or something. And I know we meant it every other time, but this time maybe we're gonna get, give it the, the teeth and the attention and um, the, the, um, that it deserves. So thank you. Closing statements or arguments, um, Senator? Sure. So as a teacher of 25 years, um, the first school that I ever taught at was in North Minneapolis. And it was the most diverse school, uh, had the most diverse variety of um, teachers of color in that school. And it was a beautiful thing. It, uh, each one of those teachers brought a very unique and um, interesting way of, of, of uh, adjusting to the work that we had to do in a very diverse community as well. The one uh, in part of this bill is around mentorship and I just want to um, talk about a, a black woman that was my mentor. And I was a first year teacher. She was in my classroom because she was close to retirement and she was a reading specialist. And she would sit in the back of the classroom and work with kids. And then afterwards, we would talk about my lessons and how things were going. And um, she filled me in on you know, what it's like to be in North Minneapolis, in the community, the things that were going on. And little by little, she invited me and my students would invite me, invite me to different events outside of school. And I learned, you know, the culture and the beauty of what is North Minneapolis, going to um, jump rope tournaments and going to the boys' basketball tournaments and their football games. These are kids that I taught and had no, you know, had no real experience within um, the African American or the North Side community. I moved to another school that had no teachers of, of color, and I really missed that diversity. And being the only native teacher, um, I was the one that everybody would come to. You know, what do we do for Thanksgiving? What do we do for Native American Month? How do we handle Columbus Day? All of those things. And it really does become a, ver a burden for the one person um, that represents an ethnicity. We need to have more of that. I would see our Native kids come and go, and of course, you, you know, they don't always identify themselves, you know, and they don't, they're maybe always not so visible as to what their ethnicity is, but, you know, I could pretty much pick one up and I would side up to one and I'd say, hey, you native? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, you okay? Yeah. Do you have the supplies you need? Yeah. Everybody treating you okay? Well, you know, and so we had to create these informal groups um, of support for our native kids and for other kids of color because they just weren't there, because there wasn't somebody in the school that they could go up to and, and, and relate to. And that's really what we're trying to do here. We're trying to build a rich, vibrant, diverse uh, community of learning from the earliest ages all the way through a secondary um, ed. And we have to say what it is. We have to name the issues that have prevented our teachers of color from being there and doing the work that we are. This bill will, will help with that. It might not fix it, but at least it sends that message that we do mean business this time, and this is the time we're gonna get it done. So thank you for hearing the bill. Thank, thank you. We're gonna be sending the bill um, to Ed Finance. And so all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, the bill carries. We'll see in finance. Thank you. In education finance. Thank you.